Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our session today. Um, we are titling our session, Let's Talk About Academic Integrity. And we're going to go over the why, when, and how to talk about academic integrity in your classes. So this is a panel session with panelists from lots of different disciplines. So we hope that there's something relevant to everyone who's attended uh, today. So thanks so much for coming. Uh, I'm going to start by acknowledging that today I'm on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. I encourage everyone um, to think about their own location and also potentially have how um, that relates to your work in academic integrity and as an educator today. And I know um, over the past year, thinking about academic integrity more than I normally do, it has given me another way into learning more about our host nation and Indigenous ways of knowing, and I appreciate that a lot. I'll start by um, just going over some housekeeping. So first, I'm Jackie Stewart. I am the current Associate Dean Academic in the Faculty of Science. And uh, for our speakers and my co-host today, Ainsley, um, she'll introduce herself when I pass it over to her. But a little bit of housekeeping. You received the notification that we're recording today's session. Um, so keep that in mind as we're discussing these topics. And we really wanted to make what we talk about today available for others to learn from. So that's the purpose of uh, recording. If you need closed captioning, then it is available. So you can um, turn that on, I think, at the top of the screen, and maybe Charlotte can jump in with better instructions in the chat. Um, today, we will be discussing later in the session um, some resources, and we'll post some links to our website where those will be available. We're not planning on having a break today, but since this is a Zoom session, please feel free to get up and get whatever you need throughout the session um, if you need to. It's just, you know, 80, 90 minutes, so we didn't build in a break today. And again, it's a panel session, so you'll be able to interact with us in the chat if you desire throughout the session. Feel free to converse there if you want, and there will be time at the end to ask questions. That's kind of how we're structuring the session. Um, but again, if you want to jump in and ask questions in the chat, either Ainsley uh, or the panelists can answer there as well. So I think that's all for the housekeeping. I'm going to turn it over to Ainsley Rouse, who will open our session. So thanks everyone for joining us on the panel this morning. We're really thrilled to be bringing together this group of experienced panelists from across the disciplines to discuss the why, the when, and the how of integrating academic integrity discussion and learning into courses. So my name is Ainsley Rouse, and I'm the Academic Integrity Senior Manager in the Office of the Provost and Vice President Academic. Our panelists today come from across campus. Dr. Jackie Stewart from the Faculty of Science, Dr. Pete Tastafichuk from the Faculty of Applied Science, Dr. Brianne Orr Alvarez from the Faculty of Arts, Dr. Jessica Kalra from the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences, and Dr. Leila Ferreira from the Faculty of Arts. Our aim today is to bring together this interdisciplinary group to offer a range of perspectives and ideas that will be transferable to your courses. We will begin with a few words of introduction to the topic, move on to hearing from the panelists, and then learn more about some new resources that are now available at UBC and conclude with some audience questions and discussions. So firstly, I'd like to just take a few moments to say a few words about ongoing work in the area of academic integrity at UBC Vancouver. Over the past year, there has been, in been institution-wide work on this topic across both campuses. The Academic Integrity Project in Vancouver is based in the Provost's Office and has worked closely with a cross-functional working group chaired by Jackie Stewart. Over the past year, we engaged in a number of projects aimed at strengthening the culture of academic integrity at UBC and expanding how we could support faculties, faculty members, and students around this topic. Emerging from that work in March 2022, the Provost's Office has launched the pilot phase for an academic integrity hub, next slide please, which will continue to work across three key pillars, institutional support and awareness, academic integrity education, and academic misconduct support. While this project was launched in the pandemic and pandemic challenges certainly drew increased attention to the topic, Academic integrity, as you all know, is fundamental to how we teach, how we learn, and how we work at UBC. We hold as a central principle that academic integrity is a shared value and a shared responsibility, and that we cannot underestimate its importance. Some of the key values, next slide please, and ideas that have emerged from our work outline an approach to academic integrity and academic misconduct that engages stakeholders across the university 
values educative responses and seeks to elevate the value within the community. With that, I'm delighted to open our panel discussion around how these ideas may translate in practice and allow our panelists to share their approaches. Next, please. Our first panelist is Dr. Jackie Stewart. Jackie is currently an Associate Professor of Teaching in the Department of Chemistry and an Associate Dean Academic in the Faculty of Science. Previously, as I mentioned, she was Chair of the Academic Integrity Working Group at UBC Vancouver, which created the new Dual Campus Academic Integrity website, bringing together resources and on integrity and academic misconduct to support faculty, students, and staff. Jackie? Thanks, Ainsley, and hello again, everyone. Um, Here's my slide. So I teach chemistry mostly and also science communication. And so one of my real entry points into talking about academic integrity with my students has been the course syllabus. And I will admit that um, I learned a lot from a document that was being circulated in fall or summer 2020 that Lori McNeil and Catherine Ron were putting together, where people were sharing their perspectives on syllabi statements and talking about academic integrity. And certainly a lot of my teaching mentors um, really put in the boilerplate uh, academic misconduct regulation from the calendar into their syllabus and kind of that was it. But what I learned from this document that was circulating is really how to um, do better, right? Do more and potentially provide some information that's useful to students for actually learning about academic uh, integrity instead of it just seeming like a, you know, if you can commit misconduct, this is what will happen to you. Don't do that because that's really a simplistic view of this topic. And um, what I have also learned is that often students don't really know. And so the syllabus is a great way to uh, broach the subject, bring it up, unpack some of the terminology uh, that you want to talk to students about and, and do that. So I'm not necessarily saying that my syllabus statement is the best there can be. Um, but it does go beyond simply putting the regulation. So this slide shows my syllabus from a couple of years ago for introductory chemistry. And um, certainly I adapted some of this language from uh, the shared document talking about uh, defining it, discussing the importance of academic integrity in giving discipline specific actions of how students work with integrity. And so this could be, you know, making sure that when it's a lab based course, you're collecting your own data and, um, you know, it is your own work taking exams without cheating, um, completing assignments independently when I've requested, or you know, acknowledging collaboration when necessary. And so you can see that I've worked in some specifics of how I would like students to work with integrity. Then I've also linked some resources. And now certainly if I was revising the syllabus, I would link to the UBC Academic Integrity website, which is certainly going to be you know, a one-stop shop for a lot of content that's helpful to students. And the last two points here um, were really my effort to show students that I was open to talking about this topic. It's not a taboo subject in the class. Um, so really said, talk to me about this. I, I don't I don't mind. I welcome that. I want you to. And also the last sentence here, which is about what students should do if they feel pressured or they are stressed out or overwhelmed and don't know what to do. That was really my invitation that there's, you know, always a way that we can work together to help you get out of a situation of feeling overwhelmed and you should talk to me instead of resorting to something like contract cheating or, you know, copying or something like that. Um, I think this kind of fits in with the tone of my entire syllabus. So for my teaching style, this isn't entirely unusual. Uh, and I would I would hope that students would take me up on this offer. Um, but that's kind of some of the parts of my syllabus statement, um, recognizing at the end there that um, when students do um, not work with integrity, it's not just because they're, you know, not good people or anything like that. It's really because they're in a situation that is a challenging situation. And it's my job as a teacher to help them get out of that. So certainly my number one thing for academic integrity is the syllabus statement. The other thing that I've experimented with a little bit uh, are integrity pledges. And this was certainly a really common thing in uh, STEM disciplines or test heavy disciplines during the pandemic when the courses were online. 
And so this is an example of, you know, my online quiz where I tried to be really clear about what I wanted students to access and what they didn't want them to access and uh, provided some examples. Possibly I could have been even clearer about this, um, but really being specific about resources that I wanted them to use or not use and, and things I wanted them to do and not do. So that was key. And then also this integrity pledge was again, really commonly used in STEM disciplines where students have to write their name after they've read this. And I wanted to bring this up today also to see what other panelists and the audience think about this, because I think the evidence or the research on integrity pledges is sort of mixed. Um, it's not that compelling that it, it does change student behavior. Um, and so I'm sort of reconsidering this. I, I don't necessarily think it uh, prevented misconduct, just this thing. It becomes very routine. And I'm not convinced that a student really would change their behavior based on having to write this down. Uh, I think the most important thing, especially for the online assessments, is those clear instructions. I think that's actually here what's more important. But again, I want to bring this topic up as something we could discuss today. And then I'll end on this slide based on my experience teaching science writing classes or science communication classes, um, really just thinking about ways to directly instruct students on some of these skills. So where students might uh, inadvertently be you know, flagged for plagiarism or something like this based on poor paraphrasing skills. That's really common. Students come to us in the science writing skills and they don't necessarily have those um, really well-developed paraphrasing skills. So we practice and we um, explicitly teach it. And so I think that's very helpful. We do try to make the connection to scientific research. And so think of it as um, just like in other types of communication, you wanna build on other people's ideas because that's how the scientific process works. We you know, have some literature that we're, we're reading and familiar with. We might notice something that could build on that and we do an experiment to follow up. And so in the communication of those results, going back to those ideas is really important. So people see kind of the thread of scientific inquiry through the literature. And then also I have done things like um, little, you know, fun quizzes and uh, classroom activities that get into some of the nuance, right? Because it might seem very, you know, straightforward to us what's acceptable and not acceptable. Um, but sometimes there actually is gray areas, as, as many of us know, in terms of, you know, do you have to cite something that's common knowledge or not? And what's common knowledge in your discipline? And so discussing this with your students kind of does give them an idea idea of where that gray area is and, and that's okay and what they should do if they're not quite sure. Um, also text recycling is a really common thing in science in terms of method sections. If people are repeatedly using the same method, um, often the text is reused and so that, you know, is that plagiarism? Is that not? How does that work in our discipline are all things that we can talk about in these classes. So that is how I have so far incorporated academic integrity into my classes. I'm happy to talk about it at the end and I'll hand it back to Ainsley. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, our next speaker today is Dr. Brie or Alvarez. Brianne teaches Spanish and language and literature courses in the FHIS department and is the founding director of the FHIS Learning Center, a free service available for students of all levels and languages of the FHIS curriculum. Brianne has presented on academic integrity at UBC and beyond, serves as a contact point for academic integrity questions in the Spanish language program, and was involved in Dr. Lori McNeil's TLEF project on academic integrity, which explored the impact of the explicit teaching of academic integrity on student engagement in writing and research as they transitioned from high school to university. So welcome, Brianne. Thank you, Ainsley. Wonderful. So um, with that introduction, I do, I do have to credit, um, just as Jackie did, um, Dr. Lori McNeil for a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, because I learned so much about the importance of explicit instruction of academic integrity um, in, at that point in the literature classroom. Today, I'm going to take a little bit of a turn and talk about what academic integrity looks like in a foreign language discipline. Um, and I have structured my intervention around three points. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the context that Ainsley presented in the introduction, the context within which I deal with academic integrity. And then I'm going to talk about a course specific approach using Spanish 101 as an example and some of the challenges and solutions to those challenges that, that I have 
been able to come up with thanks to my students mostly. So in the FHIS department, I, I have a few different roles within which I'm engaging consistently with academic integrity. Uh, the first is as a Spanish language and literature instructor. So most of the instruction um, that I'm dealing with is in a different language, a language that is not my own, and it is not the language of, of many of the students that I'm teaching. So additional language instruction is a specific piece that I'll address here. And then I also um, direct the FHIS Learning Center, which is a hub of um, tutoring and resources available for students of foreign languages and literatures. So academic integrity is a big piece of what we do there. I'm not going to speak directly to this today, but I'm happy to answer questions later on. And then I'm also the Spanish language program director, which puts me in a position to um, sort of help guide some of the discussions on academic integrity that go on in the language courses. And we've seen a lot of things happening, particularly with online language learning. And I'm going to speak specifically to those through the lens of the Spanish instructor, which Jackie, if you'd um, <laughs> next, please, my little star. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to talk about um, my general approach in all three of these roles is to very clearly outline expectations and policies as Jackie did in her syllabus statement. I do something similar um, in my syllabi. And I found that it's very important to, to define along with students what academic integrity looks like because they come with quite a bit of knowledge and um, they've had a lot of practice with academic integrity and we don't always align, but I would like us to align particularly in a course-based context. I think it's important to, to apply what we're talking about. So once we have a working definition, what does that look like in practice? But also to allow some wiggle room, some flexibility for how that may shape and shift differently based on different assignments and assessments that we'll go through together. Um, and this is this brings me to the importance of revisiting and refining what academic integrity looks like. I think that students of Spanish 101, as we'll see, start with a specific definition of what academic integrity looks like. And a lot of it is like, I feel so much stronger with Google Translate behind me. <laughs> and then by the end of the course, I think they have a much richer understanding of how they can use those tools or not in the context that we're looking at. Um, I encourage, just as Jackie mentioned, uh, that students question what academic integrity is and to play with what it looks like and to use tools that help them along the way and sort of find their own gray space um, as they're working through the, the definitions. Um, this is just an example of um, the course overview, the course description of Spanish 101. And I wanted to show this particularly because um, from the time that we are pitching courses to students in foreign languages, um, it's very important, the last line here, um, that they're going to learn the fundamentals of the language, they're going to engage with real world uh, context and course materials, but they're also going to do so in accordance with diverse academic integrity expectations and practices. So right from the course description, they know that, that we will wrap our minds around this together. And um, next slide, please. And this also sort of bleeds into what is more of a, a holistic approach to teaching academic integrity. I think um, I agree wholeheartedly with what Jackie said. I think we, initially we put a statement in the syllabus and that was it. But now if it's not a wholesome part of everything that we do, um, particularly in my discipline, which is helping them engage through a different language with multiple skills, um, including reading and writing and speaking and listening, um, I'm not doing my job. So I do see it as a responsibility to teach it throughout. And it's their responsibility to think through it with me throughout the course. Um, I really like this um, sort of progression that Jackie and Ainsley came up with together to prevent, teach, and respond. So I'm going to speak to what academic integrity might look like in a Spanish 101 or any language course in Spanish. Um, for me. Um, so I think it's very important to think that, um, you know, if we're thinking about academic misconduct, we want to prevent that from happening. And the way to do that is through academic integrity, framing it in a very productive way that isn't framed with negative consequences if you don't do this or if you do do this, but rather practices and ways of engaging with it um, as a discipline. So just like Jackie, I put a lot of emphasis on academic integrity in the course description. 
in the expectations and policies that go into my syllabus. Our department has a statement about academic integrity that's specific to foreign language disciplines. So I talk to them about that. It's not just something that's plopped in there. Academic integrity is a core learning outcome, not just on the syllabus for the course in general, but on every single assignment, assessment, um, different type of activity that we're going to do. Um, and just as Jackie mentioned, I do view it as an open dialogue and I will showcase the innovative ways in which students have engaged with academic integrity right from day one. I think using the student um, experience as a way to reach out to students is probably the best um, that I've, I've seen uh, and it's very productive. I also think that beyond prevention, we should, and I've, I've had success with academic integrity discussions when I'm actively teaching it. Um, I like to talk to my students about workshopping what academic integrity looks like for each different assignment and encouraging them to talk to me about what things look like, particularly because um, I understand as an instructor that if a student has gone to Google Translate and they have turned in a, a written paragraph that has been vented through Google Translate, I will notice immediately that this is not a one-on-one level, but they will not. So I actually show them what it looks like when a student does this, the types of verb tenses that appear that are way beyond their level, almost native speaker-like. And so just showcasing that this is not exactly what, what we are working toward in this very beginner course, but it's something that we can work toward as we move toward native speaker habits and things like that. So the idea of workshopping it makes it more approachable to them. And it also shows them that for me, it is also a work in progress and something that I'm very open to converse about. So Google Translate will um, appear, but it's me teaching them how to engage with this tool at 101. And maybe it looks differently at a 401 level where they're actually engaging with translation practices. So just graduating with them and using the tools that they're very fond of um, to help them through that. So teaching even the, the things that were, you know, like, like Jackie said, you know, it's not a taboo, but it could be if we didn't, if we didn't address it properly. Um, and then the final is, is responding. I mean, I think um, the response also goes in for me with the prevention and teaching because um, I like to talk to the students about when I'm looking for academic integrity and what it looks like, um, we inevitably are scanning for what it doesn't look like. And these are the ways in which I might engage with looking through. If I look at the view quiz log and I see that you've left the page 50 times when it's a closed book quiz, um, that's an indication to me that you may not have agreed with our pledge or with the, the policy that they actually have to sign on our quizzes too. Um, and I'm open to, you know, sort of workshopping that too, because I'm not sure what to do about that. But um, just sharing with them on my end, this is what this looks like. And I think it helps them understand that it's not that we're policing, it's just that the technology itself indicates things to us. When a text is highlighted in gray, um, this seems to indicate that it's been copied from elsewhere and pasted in, in your quiz and things like that. Um, and then also, uh, I think, and this is the toughest part about academic integrity is as long as we're teaching it, they're used to this open dialogue and conversation. Um, but it's also a difficult conversation when you notice that they have gone against the grain that you've established together. Um, but I do approach that as a learning experience for me because a lot of times when students do um, commit academic misconduct, what comes up in their response is how tight they are for time, how many classes they have to take, how costly the courses are, how managing work and school and everything else is very challenging for them. So then it helps us sort of think through some of the challenges that they're facing. Next, please. Um, so the, the first thing that students say when they um, maybe don't appreciate what academic integrity looks like um, and actually thinking about the verbal production or written production at a 101 level is that they don't wanna sound childish. They think that they are wasting my time if they turn in something that is of that level. And so then it's my job to sort of 
um, bring them back to the learning outcomes and show them just how far they've come and just how far we will go in this very basic course. Next, please. Um, so I think too, I mentioned this before, but just educating students on the tools, I bring all the tools to the fore. I mean, I have experience in translation, so I know exactly, I tell them I need help sometimes, and this is when I need help, and this is what I reach out for, but at your level, this might be how I would cater the use of, um, you know, the, the tools to your level. Next, please. Um, one of the challenges that I have had as an instructor, and I think students have too, even the ones that are actually really trying to abide by these definitions and practices that we come up with together on academic integrity is just that when you're in a foreign language context, Canvas, if you don't use a lockdown browser or some sort of invigilation software, it will actually auto correct for you. And there are ways to put it in the language. So there's really no workaround if you want to respect them as human beings and adults and not, you know, police everything that they're doing during the quiz. So I find that as a sort of systemic challenge, and I'm not sure how to go about that yet. Um, but one solution, and it's also a challenge for students, is um, I find myself more and more going toward oral assessment as opposed to written, because it's a way, it's something that they can do together in groups of students. Speaking is a very core skill in a foreign language. They should know how to do it, and they should work through some of the anxiety that comes with speaking a different language. Um, but what I've heard on the student end is, you know, great, Brie, we like oral assessments, but don't overdo it just to, you know, overcompensate for, um, you know, academic integrity concerns and other skills, because it's very stressful for us to be on the spot and performing and speaking. So this goes along with another type of pedagogy that um, I know Layla has been working on in, in Moberly in, in first year programs as well, which is speaking pedagogies and teaching students how to engage communicatively um, and what that looks like and how we build their confidence. So some of the ways in which um, we sort of solve these things together is by sharing stories and experiences with students and they share their stories and experiences with me. So if there's uh, a situation I can share about uh, grade boundary and academic integrity, my use of Google Translate and where it went wrong for me, for example, I share those stories and I encourage them to share with me as well. Next, please. Um, by far, the, the biggest solution is to scaffold assignments, particularly in my discipline where students are working toward very big goals in a very different language from their own. Um, just making sure that we're setting them up for success by encouraging informal and formal engagement with the language in ways that make sense and that build toward a broader course-based assessment. Um, next, please. And I think the, the biggest thing that I see, particularly in first and second year students, is just that managing, taking five courses online, in-person, hybrid, from home, from campus, it's a lot for students to manage. And so just talking to them about time management and goal setting strategies, because a lot of times when academic misconduct occurs, it is a result of them scrambling to just get something done at the last minute. And scaffolding helps with this as well. And then um, Jackie mentioned this too, but I think the most important piece is just communicating, building communication opportunities among instructors, TAs and students so that they're able to ask questions when they have questions and you're able to showcase and model what the boundaries look like and what the best practices are. So these are just a few ways in which um, the context within which I'm engaging with academic integrity um, and the ways in which we use it sort of come up in, in Spanish 101. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Jessica Calra. Dr. Jessica Calra is an assistant professor of teaching in the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Science. She's an academic integrity advocate, a role that developed out of her work as a curriculum consultant. Academic integrity is part of her SODL and research portfolio in her current role. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you, Ainsley, and thank you, Jackie, as well as Bree. That was a lovely introduction and lots to follow with. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure for me to be here in this uh, uh, panel 
discussion today. Uh, I'll just quickly introduce myself and how I came to the academic integrity world. I've been an instructor and an educator for quite some time. It's been over 18 years uh, teaching in health sciences, bioinformatics and biology. Uh, but I just started at UBC as an assistant professor of teaching in the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences just last July. So I'm, I'm new to the UBC community, uh, but definitely not to higher education. Now, in addition to the role of uh, an educator, I also have a position as a scientist at the BC Cancer Research Center. And I have, uh, at that spot, I play a consulting role, and then I have a wet lab research uh, program at Langara as well. So my interest in academic integrity is both in the context of educational integrity, as well as research integrity. I've done much more work, uh, scholarly work in the area of educational integrity or academic integrity as it sits in the classroom setting. And this particular work developed uh, quite organically, I would say, uh, from the role I played as a curriculum consultant between 2018 to 2021. Uh, during that span of time, that was sort of pre-pandemic and then intra-pandemic and now coming through to post-pandemic, I hope. Uh, at that time, the Teaching and Learning Center that I was working in was receiving increasing requests from faculty across disciplines for support in addressing and promoting academic integrity in higher education. And what I found myself doing is having these one-on-one -on -one conversations with instructors and educators, but at the same time compiling uh, quite a substantial number of resources that had much wider applications than any single instructor in any particular classroom. And at the same time, or in parallel, I was having some really interesting conversations with folks in the Center for Intercultural Engagement, as well as our Director of Academic Integrity and Student Conduct, Maggie Ross. Um, and the conversations were going beyond the classroom and really thinking about like, what does academic integrity mean uh, in this landscape uh, that's very global, uh, as well as in the context of higher education and our institution. So the group of us kind of worked together to synthesize some of these conversations and what's going on in the classroom setting to develop resource materials. Um, and then we put it all together as an open access toolkit for educators and that that uh, open ed education resource is called Encouraging Academic Integrity through a preventative framework, and it's available through BC Campus and has been since 2019. And I'm going to put the, the link in the chat there for you, just in case you want to peruse through that document. But the idea for this, this toolkit was that we wanted to really create a fulsome support for educators internationally across disciplines with tools for talking about and thinking about academic integrity, particularly in a, in a culturally diverse climate. Um, and in addition to that, providing methods and strategies for preventing misconduct in the classroom setting. So that, that's the document there. Um, and that's particularly where my interest in academic integrity started. And now four years later, I consider myself an academic integrity advocate whose subtle work, as Ainsley mentioned, uh, in this area is just beginning. So as an educator at UBC now, uh, part of my education leadership um, is to do more of that work around what exactly does integrity mean and how do we express it. And my particular focus comes from a statement that was made from Thomas Lancaster, who's a big advocate of academic integrity from uh, Imperial College in London in the UK. Uh, and he proposed at some stage, at some seminar, is it possible to talk about academic integrity in a positive light? And so I, I think that we can. And I think in order to move away, that move the conversation sort of towards that positive approach, we need to uh, move away from the moral panic, and that's a quote from someone else, and punitive approaches to academic misconduct um, to a more productive and preventative conversation where we can consider our students to be stakeholders in their education so that we work together to develop that shared definition of integrity that considers the rich cultural and social diversity of our academic community, and also um, sort of uh, thinking about the evolution of what integrity looks like as the technology landscape changes. 
so I think I've, I've heard a lot of that conversation already being had in what Jackie and Bree mentioned uh, as well. So what, what is it that I focus on? Well, what I'd like to focus on in my classroom is that concept of prevention. Um, next slide, please. So the what is all about prevention and prevention is actually quite a complex concept. And if you look at just the generic definition that you pull from a, a, a dictionary, it's the act of stopping something or the act of stopping someone from doing something. But I'd like to propose or take a moment to share with you a definition that comes from healthcare. As I mentioned, my background is in cancer research. Uh, and we, uh, in my lab, we look for new therapeutic strategies to treat cancers. Uh, and when researchers and health worker, healthcare workers think about prevention, it's considered from a three-pronged perspective, uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary. So when we consider primary prevention in healthcare, we're looking at uh, things that we can educate people on to help to recognize what we can do to maintain a healthy lifestyle and avoid a condition such as cardiovascular disease or diabetes or even cancer in the first place. So uh, as an example, no smoking campaigns that came out of the 70s and 80s uh, or limiting smoking or reducing smoking uh, was an education strategy that actually had a big uh, momentum towards decreasing lung cancer. And similarly with uh, exercise and diet campaigns, uh, we've seen actually decreases in cardiovascular disease and, and diabetes and even um, dement certain types of dementias. So that's primary approach. It's all about education. Uh, the secondary approach to prevention is more of a screening process where we identify risk factors and create tools for early detection and management while that condition is in early stages and can be uh, mitigated uh, using some uh, less invasive approaches. And then in the context of tertiary, this is the situation where unavoidably someone has been diagnosed with a condition and now they need to be treated. So treatment is the last of the prongs uh, and that person will be treated for the purpose of restoring their health. Now, um, I like to joke that I'm not, when I talk about this, I'm not saying that academic misconduct is a disease, <laughs> but I do believe that uh, the approach to prevention that's used in healthcare can be applied here. So if we think of primary, primary is that education piece. And I, as, and I'm hearing a lot of other folks that have presented already, uh, believe that acting with integrity is a skill that requires definition and practice, especially in the context of our culturally diverse uh, classrooms where definitions may differ depending on your cultural or background or your intersectional, uh, intersectional identity. And then uh, the secondary piece to prevention of academic misconduct in my mind means identifying the challenges that students may face that lead to misconduct behaviors. And some of those already came up where time management and organizational skills and that sort of thing are where we look at that concept of this is the risk for where students are most likely uh, to um, go into this, this type of misconduct behavior or, or use things like CHEG or um, contract cheating sources. So what secondary means to me is looking at ways that we can design our classroom settings, our uh, assessments that engage our students and teach them how to avoid those challenges. And then in the tertiary setting, the tertiary setting is the space where uh, there's going to be students that cheat no matter what we do. So unavoidably, there's a students that that's found themselves uh, in a situation where they've not met academic uh, expectations. And in, in the context of tertiary prevention, I'm really looking at this as a uh, means to implement restorative practices, using it as an educational experience for those students as well. Um, next slide, please. I, I really love this quote from David Mallon. So if the context of my conversation here is, is what, and the what is prevention, the why is summed up by this quote where Dr. Mallon says, I'd much rather spend my time on the students who need help than 10 times that amount of time documenting plagiarizing cases. And I think this is true for all of us. Um, we, we would rather spend the time with our students doing the work of our subject as opposed to the paperwork and following the procedures for reporting misconduct, whatever that misconduct looks like. 
So if that's the why, the next question is, well, how do we get there? How do we as educators and instructors move away, move away from that, um, that sort of rule following approach, the punitive approach to academic misconduct cases into a more preventative space? And if that's the, the why we're doing it, then in my mind, the how, um, if I had to define or categorize my main approaches for how, uh, I've sort of got, again, a three-pronged approach. I like the, the number three. Um, firstly, uh, is the methods that I use to foster that culture of integrity. And I do have to say a lot of these methods, um, I echo from what uh, Jackie and Bree have already talked about, but it really is thinking about that primary prevention, that education strategy, talking to my students and coming to an agreement on those definitions of integrity, being very explicit about what academic integrity lo looks like in my classroom. Because integrity, as I mentioned, is a learned skill and the expression of integrity is gonna vary from person to person, institution to institution and discipline to discipline. So it's, it's up to us to uh, do that, that work towards helping students understand what academic integrity or research integrity looks like in our spaces. And some very quick examples of, of how we can do that that doesn't take a lot of time is, um, again, to establish those expectations right from the get-go, to tell the students exactly how you want them to do their work, uh, to ask them uh, to explore strategies that support their integrity and mitigate those challenges that might lead to academic misconduct behaviors. And I've got a quiz that I ask the students to do uh, to, to look into that. And then the, the really simple thing that, you know, I started doing uh, a couple of years ago is modeling integrity. So if I'm asking for my students to cite their sources and presentations, I feel like I should be doing the same thing. So in every slide, I'm asking myself, have I done the appropriate background work to model integrity in, the, in what I'm presenting? And then the next two pieces uh, of intentional assessment design and engage, engaging students, in my mind, these two are interconnected and they both fall under that category of secondary prevention, understanding the risk factors and designing my courses uh, in such a way that help to mitigate those risk factors for students uh, uh, going out and potentially uh, expressing misconduct behaviors. And I'm not going to go into too much detail because I, I don't think I have lots of time left here, but there's lots of examples in that toolkit that I've put to, in the chat there that encouraging academic integrity through a preventative approach uh, that go into examples of assessment design strategies. Scaffolding is one example, using authentic assessments or renewable assessments that are uh, much, much more um, process oriented, but also help to engage the students. So there's lots of examples, very um, uh, specific examples in that toolkit. The, the last uh, thing I'll leave with here is uh, another quote, because I love quotes. Um, I, I came across this one in a seminar last year, or in 2020, and it says, if you want to make a student that almost never plagiarizes or cheats, you need a student that is passionate about the assignments, confident in their skills to do those assignments, and has the resources to complete the tasks they are given. And to me, this, this sort of speaks to uh, intentional assessment design, uh, considering our students as stakeholders, and ensuring that I'm teaching uh, integrity by giving the students what they need to be able to complete their assignments in a way that is engaging and fruitful for them. So I will leave it there and uh, save the rest for the questions. Thank you very much, Jessica. That was that was wonderful. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Leila Ferreira. Leila is an assistant professor of teaching in the School of Journalism, Writing and Media. Leila's focus is on the inclusive teaching of academic writing by addressing the often gatekeeping function of writing and writing assessment across and within the disciplines. This includes how we do or do not teach students about academic integrity itself. Welcome, Leila. Thank you so much. Um, what I, 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 I'm so grateful to be here learning from my colleagues and sharing what I know and um, a, much of there's quite a bit of what I will say that's going to be reiterating what my colleagues have said. Um, I am bringing my experience of 12 years teaching uh, primarily first year writing courses at UBC 
and we teach most in words in words. Uh, so we're part of uh, JWAM, and we teach most art students, most first year art students, and most uh, first year science students as well, um, academic research and writing. So I'm kind of bringing my experiences with that. So we're we're teaching academic integrity in academic writing courses. So our courses are really focused on academic uh, research and writing. So the teaching of academic integrity is really vital to that. Um, I was also um, uh, participated in, in Laurie McNeil's TLEF project that uh, Bree was, was mentioning. And Laurie, I just credit Laurie for being so in the forefront, so much in the forefront of getting this conversation started and really developing a, a change in mindset around how we teach academic integrity and, and, and how we do this across disciplines in all levels um, at the university. So some of the foundations for me as I was thinking through what I was going to be talking about today, um, that the teaching, learning, practicing academic integrity is an ongoing process. And I think we need to include ourselves in that process, our students. And so it's not something uh, that's just the responsibility of writing courses and instructors. And I and that's what I really credit the university as well for, for, for getting um, us across the university to be talking about the responsibilities we have. In, in teaching academic integrity to our students because it's so contextual. It varies depending on cultural, institutional, disciplinary context. Um, and students want to know how best to do it. So it's not most students that I encounter in my first year writing courses and beyond um, are when we have lapses in academic integrity many, many times. And as was shown through Lori's work uh, through the Cheating Hearts uh, project, that students want to know, but there are all these different factors that might play into um, you know, how they end up in that position, right? And so um, the students want to know. And so if we can you know, take a different mindset and, and an approach to our students and not looking at it from that deficit model of, oh, these students are always cheating, <laughs> things like that. Um, we look at it like this, they do want to know. And then also, I, I think Bree mentioned this as well, sharing our own experiences. I can talk about my own experiences from, because my PhD is in English literature and my own experiences with um, academic integrity, my own experiences with citation, it fosters conversation conversation alleviates shame and fear because there's a lot of shame and fear and judgment around um, say cheating or plagiarizing and students have they also judge one another in relation to this issue so really fostering that open conversation and sharing our own experiences as faculty can really um, foster a positive um, the relationship with academic integrity and that culture, right, that Jessica was talking about. So what I'm going to do is sort of think a little bit about how in there's, you know, some of the ways in which I approach this with my students in our course, you know, this is a conversation that starts on day one, um, just as other people have shown us in the syllabus, having that learning based language related to learning objectives and goals in your syllabus having all of this materials on Canvas. So making accessible those resources to students as um, inclusively as possible and in many ways in which they can access it. Um, if you're going, and if you have like some, an academic integrity unit. So we do have a unit where we focus specifically on academic integrity. Um, as well, it's just you really want to think about it as empowering students through knowledge. So knowledge of standards, policies and processes, but it's also about addressing as some of my colleagues have already pointed out those complexities, the gray areas, the challenges, the opportunity, like what what exactly does academic integrity do for us? Why, why do we care? And so having more nuanced conversations that carry on throughout the course. So return to earlier discussions, bring up examples from earlier, connect to each specific assignment, link as well to research ethics. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later in my presentation. So these are all things that my wonderful colleagues also have pointed out, right? So we're seeing patterns here of things that work and that are really important and that aren't that onerous to begin to do in your own courses, right, across the university. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things that I do, um, because we're, deal we're teaching our students 
um, you know, summary and, and incorporating other people's work into our own, our own writing, other people's writing into our own writing, and all of those uh, complex activities that we engage in as scholars. <laughs> and also like at the foundation of, of you know, knowledge making being this um, sort of concept of intertextuality. So I kind of, I sort of, I frame it with theory, right? Here we go. Let's talk about big picture ideas around intertextuality and what have other people said about this and how texts carry texts within them. And, you know, so we have from literary criticism, Julie Kristeva, we have Norman Fairclough from linguistics, thinking about different ways that this functions. Like, what are we doing when we're engaging with other people's writing and, and how much of our own writing is actually incorporating what other people have written? So we look at that in court of like, what does it look like? We look at it in, in terms of popular culture, like Stranger Things was just, you know, the new, the new season of Stranger Things was just uh, released. And that is a hodgepodge of <laughs> intertextuality. Um, so we talk about those kind of popular culture uses in music and television and movie and literature. Um, and we think about like, how do they engage in this, these forms of intertextuality? Why are they doing it? What does it allow them to do? How do they acknowledge their, uh, the, their resources? So in a, a show like Stranger Things, they never stop and say, oh, this is from, you know, ET, uh, you know, this year, da, da. they actually, it's like people in the know recognize it. You know, everybody who grew up in the 80s knows exactly what the references are, but other people might not. Right. So they have to kind of look, look it up. So we talk about all those kinds of things and so many interesting examples have coming up. So I have come, have come up. So I have musicians who talk about in jazz, how a jazz musician will show uh, like respect for another jazz musician by incorporating one of their phrases right in the middle of their sort of performance. So people will know because they're, you know, they know about jazz, but not everybody in the audience will know. So we talk about those different ways that we incorporate other people's work in our own work. So we talk about that in the context of popular culture, but then we bring that into the context of the scholarly conversation um, and how we attribute our sources in the, in the scholarly context. I think, um, you know, Jackie, uh, you were talking about how in science, you know, sometimes we might not always attribute a source. It's just, it's just common knowledge. Um, so, what ways do we, when do we attribute our site, our sources, when, uh, you know, in particular contexts, might we not attribute our sources? And we sort of learn about how in the scholarly conversation, attribution is really key. <laughs> like this is the foundation of what we do is attribution. And we again, talk about those nuances. Like what, what is it, what's the function? What does it allow us to do when we do that? Is it just about not cheating? Because students really like this idea that we're showing respect. So sure, we're showing respect to that other writer, but we're also engaging with their ideas. Fundamentally, that's helping us to develop our ideas in whatever way, whether we're opposing them or agreeing or whatever. So, so we really go through the nuances of that um, in the scholarly conversation, as all research and writing in the scholarly context is a conversation, and that attributing our sources, you know, if we don't attribute our sources, there's no longer a conversation and we're no longer making new knowledge. And so we, we have um, conversations about that as well. So we're sort of thinking about the big picture and thinking of why, like, why do we do this? What does it allow us to do? And then we start thinking of really about how we might do that. So some of the, uh, in, in our uh, program, we engage in genre analysis, close analysis of literary, um, literary, sorry, of uh, scholarly texts. So we, um, we look at scholarly texts across disciplines, right? So in the arts courses, we'll be looking at um, scholarly texts from across different arts disciplines. And also we look at in science and in the science-based courses, we're looking more of a focus on STEM, but also incorporating, um, looking at differences in terms of arts uh, writing, uh, scholarly writing. And we really look at the different features. So really getting into what does this look like? Uh, why do we cite in this way? What does it look like in these different disciplinary contexts? And I think having those conversations as well about, I can't remember if it was Bree who was talking about, you know, what does it mean for somebody to cite when they are somebody who's very advanced in their field? 
as opposed to like a student, what, how does that look different? Um, and, and so because you don't have the same kind of knowledge, right? You don't have that breadth of knowledge as so a more senior scholar does. But as novice scholars, how do we engage in this? And how might you apply it in your own writing? And again, through those analysis, we're really thinking of the function. Like, what's the function of this? What does it allow us to do when we when we cite? And why in physics do we cite in this way? And why in, in English literature do we cite in this way? And what does it tell us about the context and how and how students might use them? Um, and for me, this becomes really important. We we spend a lot of time in, in my course, and I know other uh, words instructors on research ethics. And so I also bring it back to citation and, and power. So when we talk a lot about citation as a form of power um, and academic integrity as power in terms of power as well and ethics and responsibility. Um, so this is that wonderful work um, that was conducted to establish a kind of manifesto or guide for uh, ethical research in the downtown east side. So we, we look at things like this that are talking about responsibilities as researchers, as people gathering evidence, managing that evidence, representing findings, and how we cite and how we attribute um, sources in, uh, from people from marginalized communities, right? So we're really engaged in the kind of ethical implications of, of um, academic integrity. And I'm hoping, uh, well, what I will do over this summer is developing more uh, indigenizing my, my approach to teaching academic integrity and really talking about different ways of knowing and different forms of citation and attribution um, that aren't necessarily represented um, in many of the scholarly contexts they may find themselves in, but hopefully changing more so in the future. So that's sort of that's kind of gives you a, an idea about how I how I think about it and how I approach it, and also that I'm always learning <laughs> and changing and developing how I how I teach academic integrity. Thank you very much, Leila. We have one more panelist and I'll just make a note that after our last panelist, we'll be going straight into audience questions. So just to make note of that. So our last panelist for the day is Dr. Pete Astafichuk. He's a professor of teaching in mechanical engineering and the chair of first year engineering at UBC. He is the president-elect of the Canadian Engineering Education Association, and he has been active in the national discussion of academic integrity in engineering through this and other roles. So welcome, Pete. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, and to make sure we have lots of time for questions, I'll, I'll try and move uh, relatively quickly here. Um, I, I'm going to start way, way back, though, a quick history lesson, because I think it is a little bit important for um, what I'm going to say about how we approach academic integrity uh, within first year engineering. And uh, on the left there, you can see an image of uh, the Quebec Bridge. And for those who don't know, that bridge uh, fell down not once, but twice during construction. And uh, it's very significant in engineering because it was really the fault of the engineers um, the, as to why the bridge fell down. And almost 100 people, 100 workers died as a result. And so within engineering, if you, if you don't recognize on the right, that is the iron ring. Um, that is a symbol for engineers. They wear it on the pinky of their writing hand. And it's inspired in large part by that bridge disaster. So it's, it, it is a symbol of pride for engineers, but it's also a reminder of the obligations and, um, and the, the importance of integrity and honesty and due diligence and so on in an engineer's work. Um, so next slide. Um, so we're really fortunate uh, in teaching engineers in that we have this history to work from. An engineer would receive their iron ring uh, just shortly before graduation, and then they would move on to become a professional engineer about four years or so uh, later, they get a stamp and they can now call themselves an engineering, um, uh, a professional engineer. At UBC, our students uh, took the step to bring in the iron pin, and that's uh, sort of like a lapel pin you see on the left-hand side, but really to symbolize the start of that journey. So the students, and it's not the faculty, I really want to stress this, it was the students who who said, you know, we're not becoming professionals at graduation. We're on the road to becoming professionals right when we step in the door at UBC. So they, they brought in this tradition of the iron pin, and next slide. 
there we go. And so uh, the students have done a phenomenal job in putting together uh, not just the idea of the pin, but it goes with a ceremony in the first term of first year. That's the Chan Center pre-COVID. Uh, it's a voluntary event and almost all of the engineering students come out and they, they receive their iron pin there. So it's voluntary, but they come out as if it were graduation year. They're wearing uh, suits and business attire and all that. And uh, their, their speeches and so on. But a big part of that event is they recite the code of ethics. And this is another thing that was developed by the UBC engineering students. So there's five tenets to the code of ethics. And if you, um, if you just uh, advance one slide... And there is the first tenant that's in the code of ethics. So the students, uh, this was six or seven years ago, started their code of ethics with uh, the tenant that they'll uphold academic integrity at the university and of the engineering uh, degree. And uh, so this gives us such a, a fantastic foundation as instructors to bring academic integrity into the classroom, because all of these things I've talked about, the pin, the ceremony, the code of ethics, they're all student driven. So uh, next slide, please. And so where we pick up on this in classes, we, we don't actually, we, we talk about academic integrity, but not head on. We actually talk about the requirements of being an engineer and stepping into the profession. And the fact that uh, engineers, everyone, as a matter of fact, will be faced with ethical dilemmas. So we work more from what are the professional expectations and how do you navigate an ethical dilemma? And this is a simplified framework we use, really just a Venn diagram, uh, trying to get across some ideas that, you know, there's certain obligations we all hold under the law or as a UBC engineering student or as a UBC student, uh, UBC policies. There's the code of ethics, which will hold the students to a higher standard. And then we also recognize their personal values that sometimes may or may not align with some of these other things. Um, and so we look at, um, it's a more complex framework than this, but you, you kind of get the idea that there's this fuzziness to it. There's overlapping, intersecting regions. And really when there's an ethical dilemma, a student needs to work through, figure out, well, what are they obligated to do? What do their personal values say? What do societal values say? And so on. So next slide, please. And this is, uh, there's a lot of text here, but this is basically what we would uh, do in the classroom now. So on the right-hand side is an example of a scenario. And this one happens to be um, really related to academic integrity, but we have others related to health and safety and um, uh, expectations for a professional engineer and so on. Um, but in short, you know, it's a scenario where as a student, they're working on a homework assignment and somebody borrows it. And uh, it's not clear that there's been a breach of academic misconduct here, but certainly there's an indication that that could happen. And from here, we then have the students work through and identify, you know, what is the ethical dilemma they're facing? What does that framework that I showed you, what does that say? And not only in terms of UBC policy, but the code of ethics and UBC values and personal values and societal values and so on. And then we really follow an engineering or a design process um, to solve that. So understand the problem, think about different ways uh, you could solve, uh, you could address that problem and then um, identify what the best solution is. And um, uh, so this would be done in class. Uh, it's done with students working in teams. They have team discussions. Then we report back and we discuss in, in the large class format. And this would be the place where we now start to bring in some of the specifics of, well, what exactly is the UBC policy in this case? So we, we sort of uh, sneak that in, uh, but really framing it as an ethical dilemma that the students are facing, not an academic integrity problem. And one more slide, if you could advance, please, Jackie. Thank you. So uh, as a snapshot, we're really trying to tie everything to professional obligations. That academic integrity is an example here, but when students graduate, they're going to be faced with other similar ethical dilemmas. Um, they won't be academic integrity, but they will have the same kind of weight to them at the time. Uh, we do leverage all of the things the students have put down as a fantastic foundation from the iron pin and the code of ethics. And then in the classroom, we're really working on resolving ethical dilemmas. We tried, we started by giving uh, dilemmas that might face a professional engineer. And we actually found it was much more effective to bring in scenarios that are um, more timely. And um, academic integrity is a fantastic one for where the students are at in first year. 
Um, we make sure that they're kind of murky and fuzzy. It's not black and white. A very important point I want to stress is this only seems to work when we present it as a way that if the students find themselves in the scenario through no fault of their own. They didn't make a decision to be placed in this dilemma, but um, the dilemma, uh, they found it with the dilemma on their lap, so to speak. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do try to bring in the personal values piece that, you know, sometimes we are, uh, we are faced with a situation that will challenge our personal values. We may need to take an action that we may not personally agree with, but uh, UBC policy, the code of ethics and things like that compels us to act in a particular way. And that's not just at, uh, at school, that will continue in professional life as well. And uh, yeah, and so as I mentioned, we, we really try and weave this discussion into the other uh, professional contexts. So I think with that, I'll wrap it up so we can get some, some time for the, the group discussion. So thanks. Great, thanks Pete. And to the rest of our panelists, um, really interesting overviews there. Um, now we're going to take some time for audience questions. So what I recommend for this is that the audience members, you can raise your hand if you have a question um, and then uh, I'll call on you when it's your turn. And from the panelists, I would really love if you unmuted, if you want to answer the question, and then I will also call on you um, in the event that more than one of you has unmuted um, I think that's great if we can have different perspectives answering these questions, uh, that to me would be really helpful. So I'll give people a second to think of their questions and organize my own screen, gallery view. <laughs> um, and people can certainly uh, type questions in the chat as well. We welcome that. And thanks for people's comments in the chat. Super helpful. Great. Hi, Tamara. Nice to see you. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, um, Jacqueline, my question is actually for you. I believe that you were the one who shared with us first your, um, the wording, the statement that you have in the syllabus, but all of the components. Yes. And the slide that you presented, what really popped at me, which is what intrigued me, and then I started reading the detail and you talked through and I thought it was great, but what really popped for me was the side comments that you are, or the, uh, you say, you know, definition and importance, disciplinary specific actions, et cetera. I'm presuming though, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm presuming that you only did that for presentation today. Yes. That's not actually presented in your syllabus. And it, it's, as I'm reflecting through how I might or will be expanding my syllabus for this type of thing, it strikes me that that might actually get the students reading it, is having yeah. that highlighted, those highlighted sections. And I'm curious whether you gave any thought to to doing something like that, to actually... That's a great question. Yeah, um, great question. I think in terms of syllabus formatting, probably many people in this room have thought about that because syllabi are getting longer and longer and it's so much text and we know many students don't read it. That's where those kind of jokes come in in terms of... Um, you know, it's in the syllabus, right? So that's a really good idea. I think better graphic design would certainly help um, instead of a long, long block of text and perhaps a table, something like that. Um, and I, I think the kind of terminology there in terms of what the sections are meant to do would be good subheadings or in a table format, anything like that to get across, you know, why am I, why is this so long, right? This isn't just a long piece of text. It actually has things in there for you. Um, so I would be, I would love to see other people's examples of good ways to display that information. Um, when I used that syllabus, I was at the level of what is the information I want to have on here? Not necessarily what's the best way to convey this information. And that's step two, right? So really good question. Does anyone else want to approach that? I think it was kind of more for my example. Thanks to Mara. And I see Jennifer has her hand up. Hello. Hey, just to add to that, um, two years ago when we were all online, I did, uh, I used class, UBC's um, collaborative learning annotation system. And so I had the students annotate the syllabus, find this definition, find this, what does this mean, paraphrase this phrase, that sort of thing. So to get them in without me doing all the graphic design of it, but getting the students into doing it. So it was a double header of getting familiar with the class interface, but also getting deeper into the syllabus. Yeah, great. That's a great idea if you're using class in your class. And maybe Jennifer, for those who aren't aware of that software tool, you can drop the link in the chat for people um, who might not 
be aware. Yeah, really good idea. Anytime you can get the students to process the information, of course, that's better than us retelling it in a slightly different way, right? <laughs> Class okay. can be really useful as well. Um, like Jennifer, I use class quite extensively and they annotate because they can annotate um, like a, any kind of piece, any piece of text. So if you're trying to familiarize themselves with academic integrity practices in your field, having them review it through class collaboratively, identifying different features of academic integrity, it's a fantastic tool. I, I love it and the students enjoy it as well. Yeah. Wonderful. Any other questions for the panelists? Feel free to write in the chat if you want. I'll, I'll unmute myself and ask. A question oh, Jackie, hi. hi. <laughs> you know my question. Uh, I think this was awesome. Uh, I'd like to know what you, I keep my spinning, like Layla should do something for the Public Scholars Initiative. So I'm in graduate and postdoctoral studies and just wondering how a lot of these concepts and principles, A, are taught to TAs so they can, you know, use that within their um, court, like their courses, but also, you know, but there's so many professional master's programs now just wondering a lot of what was talked about today was based on undergrads, uh, but just in the grad student sphere. And, you know, of course, you know, I'm also the research integrity um, guru, but how this would fit within like orientation activities, uh, not just for graduate students, but undergrads. And if any of you're doing that, because I would see um, something like this panel uh, almost being like an awesome sort of orientation activity just to hear what people are doing because I really loved the focus on how can we do this together how can we as academics you're one of them you know how can you join this community join the scholarly conversation in a way um, that's ethical so I don't know what people's thoughts are but how do we involve grad students? That's my nutshell yeah. question. Love it, Jackie. Any panelists or audience members want to respond to that? I can respond. Although I don't. Yeah. I don't. I don't teach grad students yet. <laughs> We're developing our program, um, but. Um, I would say that I just recently had a previous student who I taught in first year, you know, I, I mentored her and she, she went on to grad school and she did talk about how difficult grad students found the writing and the practices and the expectations of scholarly writing in, in graduate study. So I think this is a great idea <laughs> to bring the focus to grad students. Yes, thank you. I think it's an excellent question too. And um, in the language disciplines that I'm involved in, um, the TAs are very involved with the discussions around academic integrity and also the senior TAs are the ones that are actually guiding that discussion on our larger teaching teams, which is really fun because there's a mentorship piece for them that sort of positions them to discuss with course coordinators what the expectations are for different assignments and assessments and then go from there. And then they're the ones that are actually helping to manage um, cases when um, things are not going well. So they'll sit in on the conversations with the, the course instructor to sort of figure out how to deal with it because they are there are some uncomfortable conversations, particularly in the online learning environment. Um, but I also wanted to speak to the, the learning center that I direct because we also have graduate teaching assistants who hold their office hours there. So there's a lot of discussion of uh, what the what are the, the boundaries when you're actually tutoring someone that is or is not your student, um, you know, particularly if you are a native in a language and they are not. So how do you deal with that? So a lot of our, our training program in general is, is built around academic integrity in different contexts. And, and um, like Peter, we use case, we, we actually use situations that have come up. So it's easier to speak to the truth and to, to show how the graduate teaching assistants who are working with us, or even we have undergraduate teaching assistants or undergraduate tutors too, just like how to work with peers in, in those types of situations. But I think it's an amazing um, question and it's, it's something to work toward more deeply in, in my discipline at least. Thanks, Brian. Any other people want to tackle this one? Oh, mm -hmm. ah, thanks, Kelsey. Jackie, all you have to do is invite us. <laughs> well, I already have for one thing, but something I know, else, true. I'm just, yeah, it would be great. Yeah. 
Yeah, and really involving, I, I'll just add, I think um, it, for graduate students, focusing on this topic helps them in both of those ways, right? Their own work and then also confronted with their teaching duties and how to be aligned because I think uh, we definitely want alignment. And I'm thinking of the sciences, if we had graduate students who were giving one message about academic integrity that was really counterproductive to what, what environment and culture we're trying to create, that could be uh, really problematic. So absolutely this educative approach and um, you know how we are nurturing the student's growth and development is something that we need the graduate students to be on board with as well when they're TAing. Um, just reading Helen's comment. Thanks for that. We have another question from Jennifer. Yeah, Jennifer. She just put up her hand, right? Like just now. Yes. Okay. I saw yes, it. Now it's a separate question. Um, um, to any and everybody on the panel, regard question: If you've engaged much with metacognition, in terms of what you've learned through doing this, both the the process of incorporating, like not just completing the assignment, but discussing about discussing what you learned about having done that assignment or from really having stumbled in terms of misconduct and the like. I'm wondering if anybody's incorporated that into their pedagogy. Um, engages with learning about learning in this context of academic integrity um, through reflection or another means of talking about the changes they made or how they agreed or disagreed with the scholar, like not in that particular assignment that they've completed, but sort of as an add on or a discussion, sort of like your comments on the side, Jackie, and, you know, this is this, this is this, talking about it in that sense. I'm wondering if- But the student's metacognition, not our own metacognition as, well, as I mean, educators. I'm at this point, I'm thinking about the students, yes, okay, but I'm yeah. open to any response. Great, Pete. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's a it's a great idea. We we do talk about metacognition. We talk about study strategies and um, uh, you know neuroscience of how learning works, uh, stress management, all of those types of things. We get um, uh, I think really good buy in from the students. We haven't thought of connecting these two pieces together. Uh, and so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ponder that. It's a great idea. Uh, so I think there is something there. M my gut tells me. Um, just talking to the students, they recognize, yeah, learning is done by doing, you know, it's not, it's not listening. And then assessment is a form of learning. So I think the, the core elements of metacognition are coming through. I would, I don't have any data, but my, I, I can only believe it's helping uh, with academic integrity, but I think maybe, and maybe to your point, we need to be a little bit more explicit about that. Yeah. Jessica. Jump in. Yeah, I am. Um, I have to say, I don't think I've done anything formally where I've said I'm, I'm going to set about doing this to be able to assess metacognition, but I have added a bunch of reflection um, and surveys that ask the questions like just the, the course that I finished teaching uh, this past semester. It's the first time I taught it. Uh, I went I did my last survey where I asked the students, you know, we had this mission statement and these learning outcomes at the beginning of our, our uh, class, and this is what we agreed on. Did we accomplish those tasks? And if we did, how did we, or how did you? Um, and if not, what could have supported you to accomplish those tasks? So I think that kind of speaks a little bit to uh, getting the students to think about and reflect on what they learned and why they learned and how they learned it and how they could learn it better. Um, but the other, and so I've done a lot of like those kinds of little pieces adding to it to, to sort of gain my own perspective on how are my students receiving this this uh, material and how, how do they actually think and feel about that material uh, but going back to the first question you asked in in your presentation Jackie where you asked about the quiz and that sort of passive agreeing to um, a whole bunch of expectations. Um, I used to do that too. And then I switched it around a little bit where the, the quiz itself became an exercise in metacognition, at least the way that I see it, in that the questions were much more active. So I, the, my quiz is certainly here are the expectations, but it's also here are three questions related to the academic in integrity policy. So you have to go and read them and then tell me two new things that you learned from that. Plus, put it into the context of our course. So why is this academic integrity policy important to pathophysiology, for instance? 
Um, and a lot of those students are going to go on to be professionals, right? So how does this relate to your future? And then the, the two, uh, third question is about what are the challenges that you could see that you face, that you might face this semester that may lead to your inability to adhere to those policies and procedures? And then give me a solution or a, a way that you might mitigate that, that challenge. And again, I, I, maybe my definition of metacognition is a bit looser, but I'm getting them to do the work to figure out what they need to be able to learn the content and to follow those policies and procedures. Whether they do it or not, that's, you know, that, that's a future Jessica's uh, problem to figure out. Um, but at least from the get-go uh, in that course syllabus and in the uh, quiz, that initial quiz, I'm getting them to actually think about it. So that, that's sort of my approach. Great, good question, Jennifer. Thanks for the discussion, everyone. Um, due to the times, so we have just seven minutes left. What we're going to do is move on from the question period, but people can still write in the chat if you want. And Ainsley and I will just discuss some of the resources that are available for people who want to incorporate more about academic integrity into their classes. So Ainsley, you wanna kick us off? Yeah, so we just wanted to compliment this fantastic panel, great discussion and questions. Thank you to everyone who's participated in this, just by drawing attention to some of the, the new and recent resources around academic integrity that can support bringing this discussion up in, in the classroom. Um, Jackie will speak a little bit um, about the new academic integrity website that was released earlier this year. We have a sort of companion document to this panel that we're going to put online and follow up um, when we share resources from the panel. That's called Teaching Academic Integrity. Uh, the Academic Integrity Working Group has also put together an introduction to academic integrity PowerPoint that you'll be able to find on the website as well. And two new resources that were developed, um, not in the context of, of our project, but recently, an academic misconduct toolkit on the Office of the Ombudsperson for Students website, but you can also find it on the Academic Integrity website where you will find both faculty checklists and student checklists around responding to allegations of academic misconduct. And then finally, I'll be, you know, I couldn't be the only one not to mention Laurie McNeil. So Laurie McNeil's um, Canvas course uh, that was, I think, a couple of years, um, but Laurie can correct me, um, Introduction to Academic Integrity on Canvas. And before we end, I'll add that our session today is a companion session to one that Laurie will be leading tomorrow um, on Academic Integrity and EDI. I believe it's tomorrow at 11. So Jackie, on to you. Great. Thanks, Ainsley. And I put the link to Lori's session uh, tomorrow in there if people haven't registered yet. This, uh, we really view this panel as sort of foundational. And then Lori's going to go into um, more about academic integrity and EDI. And um, yeah, thanks, Lori, for teaching us all you know. <laughs> but definitely go to her session. It'll be great. Um, I'll wrap up today just mentioning briefly two things. So one is the new-ish, as of early 2022, Academic Integrity website. And the Academic Integrity Working Group really led the creation of the content and the curation of the content for this website. And just a bit about the philosophy. The intention was really to bring together educative resources and uh, the way to teach academic integrity and learn academic integrity and all of that good stuff that we've been talking about today, along with things about the regulation and the misconduct process to kind of show that they're both important. Um, they both go together. We shouldn't have one without the other. Um, and so we think we did that. It was also a dual campus website. So this camp, uh, this website is really meant for both the Vancouver and Okanagan campuses as really a landing place for um, people to point their students to and for us to keep you updated on academic integrity events through the hub and things like that. So please go to the website and we would love for you to link it from your syllabus, um, things like that. If you have questions about how to, you know, navigate the website or feedback. There's a share your thoughts. So you can see on the top right here, um, we're really open to people's feedback and questions about the website. And there's a tool on there to do that. So that's the website. And then Ainsley briefly mentioned our PowerPoint deck. So this was also something that the working group created. And it is now available on the website, Ainsley. Yes. 
Yeah, sort of soon. So uh, we have worked on this as a way to encourage people to bring up academic integrity with their class. It's fully editable, but it's a starting place. So if you're someone who's really never had a conversation about this with your students, maybe download this PowerPoint, edit it to align with uh, what you want to talk about in your own course and discipline and give it a go and let us know how it works. But it's really a way to kind of try to break the ice for that. So I find in my own teaching, you know, having a starting place is really nice. So it's there for you. And it does actually touch on lots of the things the panelists mentioned today. Um, things like making a plan for for what to do if you're kind of in a in a situation that is a struggle for for you as a student and also some of the definitions and uh, ways to bring in some scenarios from your own field. And the right hand side of this slide has a new resource that the panelists today uh, created together and it really goes through the prevent teach respond uh, framework with lots of ideas for educators of how to tackle academic integrity in your classes. Um, and we really do think that academic integrity is everybody's responsibility. It is um, both important for students to have a hold, but um, throughout all of my work uh, over the past several months, I've really come to internalize this idea that it really is our responsibility to talk to students about this and to um, help them learn that just like they do any other part of their discipline. So that said, we are pretty much done. We already did our questions and we have two minutes left. So what I'll do to end us off is uh, thank the panelists. I really appreciate you taking the time to prepare and be here today to share your expertise and also to the audience members for joining us today. And we hope you have a good rest of the CTLT Institute. Thanks also to the CTLT event staff. We have uh, Suki, Charlotte, and Ainsley here um, who have been helping us out and have organized this event. So thank you very much for all of your help. And we'll close the session now. Thanks, everybody.